Oh, hello and thank you for joining me for another ITY video with top Australian and international executives. Today I have with me Andrew Powell. He's the Managing Director, Asia Pacific and Middle East for Rimini Street. Welcome to the program. Thank you. So Andrew, I thought we'd probably start right at the beginning. If you could just tell us a little bit about Rimini Street, how it started, uh, where the name came from. I'm sure there's an interesting story behind that. And what prompted the idea to do third party support for enterprise software? Sure. Rimini Street's the largest global provider of independent or third-party uh, maintenance services to SAP and Oracle customers. Mm -hmm. What that really means uh, is for organizations that have procured SAP and Oracle software, they have the a perpetual right to use that software, and mm -hmm. they do and they have, and this is a very common situation. Uh, those organizations have also entered into a maintenance agreement with SAP and Oracle. That maintenance agreement allows them to access the support portal of the vendor, mm -hmm. Service Marketplace, the uh, My Oracle support website, and it also allows them to access updates to the software. Organisations that engage Rimini Street, Street choose not to renew their maintenance agreement with the vendor, and they take a maintenance agreement with us. They do that for three reasons. There's a significant cost saving involved. Mm -hmm. uh, our price is 50% of the price paid to the vendor. Uh, secondly, there's uh, definite service improvements. Our scope of uh, service includes support for customizations, for example. And there's also some very important strategic benefits. Uh, for example, our customers are not forced to upgrade their, their product as frequently. So if I was to use a, a motoring analogy, uh, normally you'd have the support contract with your Holdens and Ford, but in, in this case you guys are the fully, uh, you know, licensed or fully authorised third party service centre and you don't just do oil changes and, and replace tyres but you're fully conversant with all the ins and outs of the of the internal so that you can even make continue to make modifications to Oracle and SAP's um, you know, software. It's a good analogy, the, the motor analogy, and it's actually quite common in general. If you think of most things that you use, it's quite common not to have that item fixed by the vendor if it breaks. Sure. Exactly the same in the software industry. Uh, Rimini's been in business now for 10 years uh, and, uh, and, the, and we've experienced massive growth during that period sure. because there's clearly a demand for, for this service. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. I mean, we take it for granted with, as you were saying, you know, with other devices to have third party support. And it's just natural that this has evolved. So how did the, where did the name come from? Was it was the business credit on this street or was the street something from, you know, one of the founders uh, past? And, uh, and what gave them the idea? They must have had some, some issue themselves with, with Oracle and SAP and I thought, damn, we've got to do something about it. The name was uh, uh, created by our CEO and founder, Mr. Seth Raven. Uh, there really wasn't a lot of thought that went into that other than, uh, you know, he tells a story where he, he had to name the company and he was sitting in a car and he, he, he looked that. out the window and he, <laughs> he saw uh, the name Rimini Street. That's a great, that's, a, uh, the, that's good enough. <laughs> the, the evolution of, of the model is quite interesting. It actually evolved back in the days of uh, primarily PeopleSoft, where mm -hmm. PeopleSoft was, was bought out. There, was a, there, was, there were certain customers who were concerned about the cultural shift that that brought to the, the organisation. Mm -hmm. And there were certain questions raised about the value they were getting for maintenance. So it sort of began, began in that area uh, 10 years ago and obviously we evolved from there to support all the other Oracle applications and databases as well as SAP products. So what about yourself? What's a little bit of your history in the industry uh, leading up to becoming the MD in uh, this region? Sure. Uh, so I started out in the charting, chartered accounting field, but I moved into the SAP and enterprise application world in 1998. Mm -hmm. Uh, I could see the changes occur in the industry over those years. Uh, things were different. Uh, in, in the early days, we, it was all about improving organisations, businesses. It was all about business process automation. And as the industry evolved, it, it changed quite a bit and I could see some pressures evolving. Uh, three years ago, I was fortunate enough to be uh, invited to head up the Rimini Street business for the Asia Pacific and Middle East region. Mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity for me is to apply what is a very proven model uh, globally, uh, particularly in North America and Europe to the Asia Pacific and that's exactly what we've done over the last three years. We've enjoyed massive success and, uh, and we continue to expand aggressively. So now, I mean, clearly supporting enterprise clients is a major undertaking. You've been doing it for 10 years as, as you say. Um, so, and obviously you're good at it, otherwise you, you wouldn't be here today. So can you just share some of who your big customers are globally and in Australia? People would know. You know. 
Absolutely, we're supporting 1,300 customers globally, including over 100 Fortune 500s mm -hmm. and 10 ASX top 50s. Uh, some global organisations include uh, Pfizer, 3M and ChemChina, mm -hmm. and some local organisations include Toll Holdings, Carlton and United Breweries, and Intertech Pivot. Okay, and I was talking to Toll recently, they were um, rolling out some new uh, Zebra devices for, for in, in warehouse tracking of, of technologies. But clearly, you know, the stuff you're working on is on the other side of all those little devices <laughs> running the databases, but that's a different story. So what are some of the main trends that we're seeing in enterprise applications today? And, uh, and how have these trends helped uh, Rimini Street's market share rapidly increase? Okay, the key trend that we talk about and we see uh, everywhere we go is this concept of what we call a hybrid reality. 15 years ago, the aims of an IT organisation were fairly clear. Mm -hmm. The aim was business process automation, and the way to do that was to implement an ERP or a suite of products. Something um, from Oracle or SAP. <laughs> something from Oracle or SAP and loosely called a, a, an ERP. Yeah. Fast forward to today, and there's been a few realisations. That core system, whether it be with Oracle or SAP, it is very valuable, mm -hmm. and it does automate those business processes, but it's not the total solution. So what has happened is organisations have evolved with this, with this ERP core, some refer to it as a core system of record, mm -hmm. but it's complemented by other systems, whether they be on-prem or, or in the cloud. So most organisations are facing this hybrid landscape, and the way things are moving, the way the vendors are also moving is that that type of model is, is here to stay for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Now what does that mean? There's probably three key things that that means. Firstly, if you look to say a Gartner, what they talk about quite a bit is a concept of the bimodal approach where you have a different IT strategy for your core system and your so-called systems of innovation. Different philosophies, different implementation approaches, uh, different risk profiles. So that's one important observation. The second observation is that you need to be very good at integration. You are stuck with the concept that you will always be connecting disparate systems, whether they be on-prem to on-prem, mm -hmm. on-prem to cloud, cloud to cloud, business to business, business to consumer. Yeah. So we all have to be good integrators. The third trend is probably where we come into play. The problem right now is that the cost of ownership of the core system of record mm -hmm. is way too high. It's way too high. So if you look at, say, Gartner again, they estimate that something like 87% of all operating cost is going into just keeping the lights on for the existing systems. Mm -hmm. There's not enough funding available for innovation. What organisations are doing is they're scrutinising the cost of that system of record. It's a good system, it automates business processes, it does its job, but it's too expensive. Organisations are therefore looking for alternative ways to reduce that cost of ownership. That's exactly what we're doing. We're lowering that cost of ownership, which is freeing up the funding for innovation. So if you take the example of Toll, which you mentioned earlier, our role in that particular situation mm -hmm. is, to, is to free up the funds to allow that innovation to take place. Sure. And, I mean, clearly companies might say, well, we're going to replace our, our core system with something else, but that comes with its own cost, having to rewrite everything and do everything. Clearly you've got companies who have you know, have uh, done virtualization, they've gone to cheaper data centers, they've done all these things. They may have even have lowered staff, but one area that they may not have thought of that, that you provide, and probably one of the few to do it, is to actually lower that whole cost of that core system down by your, your stated 50%. So, I mean, I guess from that point of view, it's not surprising that people are coming to you and saying, help us. That's right. I mean, and just to be clear, what we're talking about is the annual maintenance fee that's being paid to Oracle and SAP. So when you originally purchased the license, mm -hmm. it had a license cost, and then typically organisations are paying 22% per year on maintenance, and that is a very, very significant burden for most IT budgets. There was a recent study by PwC that rated that as one of the highest costs in any uh, operational budget. That's the piece that we are addressing. That's a piece that we're competing against. Sure. And, and without a third party a company like yourself working on those, um, offering that service, there would be no cost saving uh, other than whatever deal you could squeeze out of Oracle and SAP. Exactly. Uh, and this, this kind of leads on to how Oracle and SAP are reacting. Well, that's it. I mean, the next question is, I mean, clearly they want to defend. There's millions, if not billions, at stake. So, so what are they doing to counter you and what are you doing to counter them? 
Yeah, it, it's very interesting, and, and the word defence or defensive is is is, is quite correct. Mm -hmm. If you look at the language that SAP and, and Oracle are using now, it is quite defensive. Their posturing has changed. Their message has changed. Five or ten years ago, they were very open in their approach, but that's changing now because they're facing tremendous competitive pressures from the likes of Rimini Street mm -hmm. in the maintenance revenue, which is 50% of the vendor's revenue, yeah. roughly. And they're also facing incredible pressures from very nimble and innovative solution providers, predominantly in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So their, their positioning has changed. And how have they reacted? There's a couple of different things that have happened which are really important to understand right now. Firstly, if you look at what's happening around database, it's really interesting. Both SAP and Oracle are now aggressively steering their customer base solely towards their own proprietary database. Mm. So this is a complete change in position. Again, SAP five, ten years ago was happy for you to run your SAP applications on any database, and now it seems to be a very clear direction towards HANA. Yeah. And in the case of Oracle, they're also doing the same. They're sunsetting in certain products. They're sunsetting support for DB2. Mm -hmm. So both of them are trying to steer their, their existing customer base towards their own database. It's a, it's a race for market share at the moment. It's a grab uh, for database market share while they can. Sure. So yeah. there's some very interesting things going on there. What makes this fascinating is that the customers are not asking for this. The customers uh, want choice. Yeah, in fact, who doesn't? What, in fact, what the customer base wants is access to open source database. Yeah. And that's really where the underlying trend is at the moment. The underlying trend in database is really towards open source. So the database market is commoditizing. The vendors are trying to grab as much market share as they can in that process. That's kind of the first thing that's going on, this scramble for the database market, which I think is, is not to the benefit of the customers at all. Mm. The second thing that's going on is obviously this, this uh, race for, for cloud revenue. Yeah. So traditional revenue sources at Oracle and SAP are diminishing, mm -hmm. the market's quite saturated, and so they're looking to supplement their traditional revenues with other revenues. It's a very difficult task for these mega vendors to drive cloud revenue. It takes an incredible amount of investment. If you look at the core ERP, it's very, very complex. I've heard estimates that there are 300 to 400 million lines of code in a, in a large scale ERP. Mm. So there's a huge investment involved in trying to replicate or rewrite those applications and make them available through a SaaS model. And that investment has not been made. So what you're seeing in the cloud is just point solutions, smaller modules, but not a complete suite. And that's not going to be ready for a long time. So the, the vendors themselves have got difficulty at the moment in reinventing themselves purely because of the complexity involved and the amount of investment. Hmm. If you look at the customer side, they're struggling with the business case. They're struggling with, the, they're being told cloud's the way to go, but yeah. they're struggling with, why do I want to re-implement to just achieve the same business process automation that I've already got. In a, in a different sphere. In a, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's fine where yeah. it is. What about data security? What, what, why would I rent software that I already own? Mm. What's my exit strategy? And by the way, is this a lock-in strategy? I'm already struggling with the value proposition here. If I go to cloud, is that going to put me in a worse position commercially? Yeah. And then, of course, you've got public clouds, and private clouds and hybrid clouds and all I mean any any whatever cloud you want they'll give it to you <laughs> exactly and yeah. certain certain areas of cloud make more sense than others like obviously things like infrastructure as a service is, is really just a a case of where you want to put your infrastructure in your data center but when you get into the application layer you're talking about very complex issues related to rental mm. you're talking about complex issues related to upgrading and so it's not as clear and, and in those scenarios there really is no valid alternative to the current on-prem model for, for that core system of record at this point in time, and we think for some way to come. Yeah. But what's really driving cloud for, for these companies is Wall Street, because Wall Street values cloud revenues higher than other revenue streams. Mm -hmm. So there's a disconnect there between what the, what's right for the shareholders and what's right for the customer base. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the third, um, the third trend, the third def defensive trend by the vendors is very interesting. They are quietly but surely mm -hmm. becoming uh, more aggressive commercially. There was a very interesting study done in the US uh, three or four years ago now by Constellation where they looked at the impact on maintenance costs where there is a competitive environment created. For example, if Remini Street is invited in and evaluated, and on average an 18% reduction in cost was achieved. So what is happening is areas that were traditionally completely not negotiable mm -hmm. have started becoming a little bit rubbery, a little bit flexible. And this is not widely known, but it is, it is discussed uh, in, general, in the general market. Sure. So what you're seeing is you are seeing a reaction. You're seeing reactions in, in what's happening in Asia now is what happened in the US four or five years ago, where the vendor is realising that there is strong competition, particularly in the maintenance area, mm -hmm. and they are trying to find ways of, of defending that highly profitable revenue stream. Sure, the giants are awakening, but the nimble players are still pretty nimble. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> given, given that, I mean, clearly they're being defensive and you're attacking and, and showing companies all of those different uh, alternatives, but that's the, that's the situation today. How do you think the market will evolve over the next few years? I mean, crystal ball gazing is always fraught with, with <laughs> danger, but what do you, what do you think? What I'm seeing at the moment, and I'm quite fortunate because I get to talk to a lot of organisations all the way across Asia, I'm seeing an increasing awareness within the customer base that has evolved over time. So there was a time, probably 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, where a vendor would walk into a, a, a customer or an organisation and explain their roadmap and the, and the customer would would almost blindly accept that Jump as on board and that, that's the way yeah. to go. Yeah. But, but that's not where it is now. I think what's happening is there is a much greater awareness of vendor motivations and customer motivations and customers are realising that there is a disconnect. Yeah. So I think what's happening is you'll see more and more customers so-called take back control of their, of their enterprise uh, a roadmap and they won't just blindly follow a path that is being pushed on them by a particular vendor with a particular agenda. Sure. I mean, we've all seen where, you know, XYZ company, whether it's your smartphone or tablet or your OS, has some crazy idea, implements it, everyone hates it, and uh, resists it. <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of examples where the people love it too, but people have been burnt, and so it's not surprising that they are trying to um, find ways to, you know, forge their own path and not have one foisted upon them. That's right. They're looking to take control of their own path. They're looking to do things in their own time. They're looking to upgrade when they want to, not when they're told to. They're looking to make decisions that suit their shareholders rather than the shareholders of the vendor that they're dealing sure, with. Sure. And uh, so, I always like to change tack a little bit as we get towards the end of the interview. And just ask if you could, you know, please share the best piece of advice that you've received to help you get where you are today. It's always always something interesting. It's a good question. Um, I, I always remember a comment made by a CEO of an organisation that I was working for previously, and he spoke about the importance of being humble in, in business, and it's not an area that we often think about, but um, employees appreciate uh, a manager and a leader that's, that's humble. Uh, I think customers appreciate a, a business partner that's humble. Uh, so personally, I've learned to respect organisations I've learned to uh, respect individuals who are both successful, but can also stay humble. So that's my advice. Uh, that's the advice that's stuck with me that I try to uh, stick to. Sure, very good, very good. So do you have any final messages for ITY viewers and readers and for your current and future customers? My advice is simple. Take a good look at what you're paying every year to SAP and Oracle for your annual maintenance and ask yourself a simple question. Is this the best way to spend this particular sum of money? Evaluate the, the value of that spend and think about whether or not you could be using that, that precious budget somewhere else. There's no harm in looking at your options. Uh, there's no harm in assessing what else is out there. Uh, please consider inviting Rimini Street in to discuss your maintenance options and, and evaluate that and make a balanced decision. Andrew, thank you very much and best of luck for the future. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Alex. Thank you.